Done. Great. Thanks very much, Rachel. Yeah. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, it's going to be, yeah, talk about the fish of the River Severn, basically. So there's lots of freshwater species of fish, um, more than we're going to talk about today. Um, but the River Severn is so big. It's such a big river catchment. It's um, 220 miles long, starting in the, in the Welsh mountains, finishing up in the Severn estuary and the Bristol Channel. Um, and it, not just the River Severn, it has dozens, if not hundreds of tributaries to it as well. So a huge, huge variety of, um, of wildlife habitat in that water, ranging from um, right in the upstream, uh, shallow, high oxygen, clear, clean water, right down to the, the deep main channels south of Worcester. A uh, huge variety of habitats in there. Um, so we, this is just an introduction to 26 of the species that, that we know live in the River Severn. Um, like I say, there's a few more, but um, we, we may go into those at the end. Um, and just a reminder, yeah, please ask questions as, as we go along and um, we'll try and address as many as we can at the end. Um, so before we get into those 26 species that I mentioned, I think it's just important just to go through a little bit of background information at the beginning. Um, some of you may already know a lot of this, some of you may not, not know very much about fish at all. Um, so I'll just go through, through a few of the sort of technical terms. Not going to go into anything in too much detail. But first of all, migratory fish we'll, we'll be mentioning a lot. Um, and when we talk about a migratory fish, it's a fish that will um, live in freshwater and in seawater, and it will travel between the two. Um, so we've got anadromous fish, which are primarily sea fish. They live most of their life at sea, and they'll come into freshwater to breed. Um, just, just to spawn pretty much. And their spawning seasons vary depending on the species. For example, shad will spawn in the spring, um, salmon will spawn in the winter, um, but we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more as we go through the, the slides. There's also catadromous fish, which spend most of their life in freshwater, um, but they will return to the sea to breed. And in the UK, we have one species of catadromous fish. Um, a quick mention about the lifestyles of fish as well, the life cycles rather. Um, different to uh, birds and mammals, you know, they're, when, they're, when they hatch or born, they're, they don't, they're not miniature versions of themselves. They go through different cycles. Um, typically, they have a larval stage where they're almost mi microscopic. And then when they turn into fry or when they become fry, they're, they're very, very difficult to ID. So it's, it's not until they start growing up a little bit where you're able to, to see some of those key ID features. And some fish go through more complex life cycles, um, bec primarily because they're moving in and out of freshwater and seawater. So there's a couple of examples on screen there of the life cycles of a salmon and an eel. Um, but I know Ed will talk a little bit more detail about those life cycles um, later on. Um, so with that, it's very difficult to tell you about the size of a fish. Like if I was telling you about the size of a mouse, all wood mice will roughly grow roughly the same size. Whereas fish will reach adulthood and they'll continue to grow and their eventual size can depend on so many factors. So it's very difficult to give you a figure and say, yeah, all trout grow this size, because they don't. Some of them will grow much bigger than others, depending on their environment. So their eventual size, of course, will depend on the species. A minnow is only ever going to be a few centimetres long, and a pike could grow to you know, well over a metre. But their eventual size also depends on the, the conditions of food, the temperature, that sort of thing. So just a few... Um, terms to go through with their anatomy. We'll be describing the fish in a little bit of detail. So I'll just run through these things first of all before we get into the slides. So um, 
we'll mention the different fins that fish have and the fins are there to help them stay upright in the water to help them propel through the water to help them swim basically um, and I'll start with the dorsal fin on this diagram uh, the dorsal fin will double up as sometimes it can help they can be brightly coloured, they can help maybe attract um, a mate or a, uh, they, they can maybe um, help them defend against predation, uh, help them warn off predators. But the main function of the dorsal fin usually is to help them swim. I'm going to go around the diagram in a clockwise direction. So I'll move on to scales. Uh, scales are on most fish, but not all freshwater fish have scales. Some do, some don't. And they're part of the fish's armour, basically. So they're there to protect the, the vulnerable um, skin um, and their bodies. Um, some fish, most fish are actually a bit slimy as well, but some fish have a lot more slime than others. So um, yeah, basically scales and slime, part of its defence system. Um, and fish take in water through their mouths and they have gills which extract the oxygen from the water. And gills are quite a delicate internal organ that sit just behind their heads. So they have, um, most fish anyway, they have these gill covers behind their eyes, which are a kind of a firmer, um, thicker piece of flesh, which helps protect their, their gills. And then moving round underneath, Pectoral fins and pelvic fins come in pairs, so they'll have one either side of their body. Moving around towards the back of the fish, they'll have an anal fin, and then back towards the, the tail, they have a tail fin, which is very, very recognisable. And um, yeah, that's it, nothing too technical in there. Just mention a few things that are different in some fish. They may have an extra dorsal fin, so a couple of species that we'll go through, you'll see pictures of them and they'll have a dorsal fin and then another similar size one just behind it. So some fish have two dorsal fins. This fish on this diagram has what we call an adipose fin and it's a small fleshy fin just behind the dorsal fin. Um, not many species of fish have this, it's common in salmonids. So this picture is of a grayling and they do have an adipose fin. And lastly, I'll just mention barbula because barbula are um, around the mouth of some fish species. They are like whiskers and they're fleshy and they contain taste buds. And this helps fish kind of search for food in the, in the sediment in the riverbed. Um, so typically found on fish that feed on the, on the bottom. So I'll pass over to Ed in a minute. I'll just go through the, the subgroups quickly. We've had to split the fish up into, into subgroups. Um, so we've got six of those. Um, so game fish are typically the salmonids. Game fish is a term made up by anglers and they're sort of traditionally caught for, for, for the pot, for, for eating. Coarse fish, another angling term um, for fish that are very commonly caught on a, on a rod and line. Uh, it's typically they're cyprinids, apart from the pike and perch, which don't belong to the cyprinid family. Then we'll move on to minor species, which are the little tiddlers that you'll find if you go pond dipping, um, catch them in jam jars when you're a kid. So very, very small fish. And then we'll move on to, to shads, uh, eels and lampreys, and then we'll finish on some aliens and monsters. Um, looking forward to that. So. If it's okay, Ed, I'll hand over to you and I'll let you talk about the game fish. Thanks, Pete. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so game fish, uh, as Pete alluded to, is a bit of an angling term, um, as in game, uh, game for the table kind of thing. Uh, people still use it as a loose term. The other uh, turn of phrase you might hear is salmonids. So it's a shortening of um, salmonidae, the family that these three species sit in. And in the UK, we've got three, three species that sit in this group. So we'll run through them from the top. Sorry, Pete, can you do the slides? Thanks. Um, so first and foremost, we've got the mighty Atlantic salmon. Now, you 
most of you have probably seen this on the um, fishmongers counter at the supermarket. Um, big silver fish, uh, pretty impressive looking things. If you're really lucky, you might have seen them in the wild. Uh, if you're, you're working in the seven catchment, there's certainly places in the autumn you can see these guys swimming upstream, jumping at the barriers, making their way to the spawning grounds. So pretty impressive lifestyle, quite an epic journey they undertake. Um, bread and fresh water. So in the winter time, they lay their eggs in clean gravel, uh, nice clean rivers. They take a month or two to develop into fry, uh, or alvins as it would be. So they'll be in the gravel for a further few weeks um, as they use up their, their yolk sac from the egg. And then come the springtime, temperatures are warming, there's lots of natural food starting to appear, so they feed on invertebrates to start with. They'll swim out the gravels, um, where we call them fry. And then they'll spend usually about two years, sometimes up to three years in fresh water. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, maybe one, one year, depending how rich the feeding is. And they go through the fry stage in the first summer. They then become what we call a par. And they're quite good looking little fish when they're, they're in the juvenile stage. They're, they're, they're brightly colored, nice and spotted. And they've got these sort of bluey purple thumbprint marks along the side, which we call par markings. So after say that second year in the fresh water, they overwinter in the river. And then come the following April or May, they then start to silver up. They're probably about 15 centimeters plus long at this point, where we call them smolts. And then they make this migration all the way down the freshwater system, hit the estuary, where they undergo um, changes in their bodies. So they can um, change over from freshwater to seawater. And they make their way out to the Atlantic Ocean. Lots of them feeding north of the UK, um, Faroe Isles where those guys will probably spend one winter out of sea before coming back to spawn. Um, other fish, which are going to spend two or three or even four winters out of sea, so just stay right out there feeding on the really rich feeding that the, the ocean's got to offer salmon um, before they come back. And they're probably heading out to Greenland, Iceland, and they're making this epic journey back to the river they were, they were born in. So generally seeing salmon coming back to the rivers um, anywhere from the spring, but, but more coming to the rivers sort of uh, summertime through to autumn, where the numbers really build up and they head all the way up to the spawning grounds, generally in the headwaters of rivers, um, needs to be nice and gravelly and shallow. Um, and they, they come out much bigger from when, when they were born. So they hit the sea, really nutrient rich in the sea, um, particularly the females, they've got massive potential to pack on the weight. The bigger the fish is, the more eggs it can lay. So hence they've got that, that life history strategy. Um, Generally, most salmon are dying after they spawn, so they complete their life cycle as adults. Um, once they spawn, some will make it back to the sea and mend, um, but generally speaking, that, that's it. And the, uh, the, the, the life goes on. Next slide, please, Pete. So in, into the next fish, fairly similar, um, but different again. Um, we've got the brown trout, so this is possibly alongside roach, one of, our, one of our most widespread native species, believe it or not. They're a really, really good indicator of um, good habitat and good water quality in a river. So they need fresh, clean um, water. They need really good um, heterogeneity in the habitat in the river to complete their life cycles. We're very similar to the salmon spawning in the winter, hatching out springtime. And then with the brown trout, most of them, um, depending on the river system, will stay in the fresh water, but there's always a, a proportion of the population that will go to sea. So the richer the feeding, the less likely that brown trout's um, motivated to, to go to sea. It can grow quite big in the freshwater environment. If you go to, say, the mountains of Scotland, where quite harsh environments, cool temperatures, um, not lots of natural food around, you'll find quite a big proportion will decide it's much easier and better to go and feed um, out at sea. So a bit similar to the salmon, um, the, 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 the fish head out to sea where they can pack on the weight and get a bit bigger, lay more eggs and stuff. But generally with sea trout, they're a bit more coastal. Um, they're not making the enormous journey that salmon are making. Um, you know, looking at rivers, um, you're going to have lots of, of varied habitat. And as we said, so pools, riffles, lots of places for the adult fish to hide. And as with all the salmon, it's, as Pete alluded to earlier, if you just look towards the rear of this fish, you can see this fatty, fleshy second fin, the adipose fin. Um, 
salmon trout or grayling, as soon as you see, see a fish with that, you know it's one of the salmonids. Salmon, um, they can be quite brownie as they approach spawning, so you might make a little mistake between brown trout and, and um, salmon, but generally salmon are much bigger. Um, but yeah, brown trout, really widespread, really quite pretty fish. You managed to get them out of the water and look at them. They've got lots of nice red markings around the spots. They're, they're markings very massively um, compared to the one we've got on the screen here. And then we've got the third species in the group, the grayling, which looks totally different again. So it's a little bit of a controversial fish. Pete's already mentioned these angling terms. We've got the game fish we're looking at. We've got the coarse fish, which incorporates all the other freshwater species. Um, by angling law, grayling are put in the group of coarse fish. So some people see it as a coarse fish, but it's still a salmon. It's a theory, it's a game fish, if that makes sense. You might just about be able to make out the adipose fin towards the rear dorsal edge of that fish. Um, so the difference with grayling, they spawn in the spring, and most of the coarse fish are generally uh, spawning springtime, early summer, hence the reason it's been lumped in with that group. Looks very different again, so much bigger scales, um, very much a sort of browny, silvery, iridescent kind of sheen to its side. Um, the male fish can change when they approach spawning, so they can get very dark, um, but generally, you know, not spotted, you know, not like a salmon, not like a, a, a trout. Um, the salmon's a very solid silver when it comes in from the sea, and then it starts to go a lot more browny ready, whereas grading will sort of be much bigger scales. Um, holding on to that sort of silvery sheen throughout the year generally. Uh, the other big difference is looking at the position of the mouth. It's, it's more underslung, so a bit more of a bottom feeding specialist. So you've got that sort of niche separation between the, the, the different salmonids in a river. Um, definitely if you're angling for them or, or trying to see where they're feeding, you know, they're, they're definitely going to be targeting the more bottom feeding invertebrates. So it goes without saying all these um, salmonids Salmon when they're in, in their uh, juvenile stage, um, trout throughout their life and grayling throughout their life, they're, they're really um, designed to feed on insects in the river. Um, trout, as they get bigger, they might start to uh, feed on small fish as well, um, as to grayling occasionally, actually, when they get really big. But generally, feeding on insects, so grayling have decided to evolve to feed near the bottom, so picking up all the sort of bottoms, well in caddis, the shrimps, um, all that kind of stuff. And again, really good indicator of clean water quality. Um, you'll find them slightly lower down the catchment to trout. So trout can get into the really fast water, um, get up into the mountain streams. Grayling tend to be in the sort of slightly slower glides, the deeper pools, all this kind of stuff. Um, but once again, cool water, high oxygen levels, you're generally going to get grayling in there. Thanks for that, Pete. Thanks a lot, Ed. Thank you. Love hearing about salmonids. Um, yeah, so we'll move on to coarse fish. And yeah, an angling term. Uh, generally, if you see, see an angler sitting there uh, with, a, with a rod, watching a rod or watching a float, um, he's probably, he or she is probably after one of these species of fish. Um, so we'll go through them in, in pairs because we've got quite a few to get through. Um, roach and bleak here are sharing a slide. Um, they can be confused with each other sometimes and they share similar habitats. So I'll just go through some of the differences between the two. Um, both very common. Roach are the most common of the two species. Roach are possibly one of the most common fish in the UK actually. Um, they're, both of these species are our typical silver fish. Um, so you see them Probably when you're watching the river, you might be able to see the see them shoaling around if the water's clear enough. And um, roach don't get particularly big. Um, the guide there is between 12 and 40 centimeters typically for an adult, but 40 centimeters would be very big for a roach. Um, when you're viewing them from the riverbank or from a bridge or something, uh, you they they kind of have a greeny color to their back, so they they actually blend quite well with the, the surrounding water. But when you get them up close or in your hands, they most certainly have a, a silvery shimmer to them with a, with a blue tinge um, a lot of the time. They have a orange coloration to their fins, but as they mature, it becomes 
a, a clearer orange, it becomes uh, more vivid and they have orange eyes as well. And roach can be found in flowing or still water, more typically in flowing water though, uh, very common in rivers and probably not in the really fast flowing stretches. So more likely to get them sort of mid catchment. They'll, they'll be there in their, in their thousands, I should think. Um, yeah, a shoaling fish, um, they shoal in kind of small to, to medium um, shoals. Um, and moving over to the bleak, they're typically smaller than a roach. Um, eight to 15 centimetres there as a, as a guide for an adult bleak. They resemble juvenile herring. Um, they used to be confused with juvenile shad, actually. And they're very slim, um, slender fish with a sort of a pointy nose. And their fins don't have much coloration to them. A dull a gray color, but translucent probably. And they're more likely to be found in the slower um, moving stretches of the, of the River Severn. And I know they congregate around sort of marinas and docks and um, probably uh, canals as well. They certainly um, inhabit canals. So larger sections of the river where, where it, the flow has slowed down a little bit. And bleak do shoal in very large numbers. So a couple more species of our typical silver fish that we find in the, in the river catchment. Um, Dace and Chub here are sharing a slide. Um, they can be confused with each other, especially when a Chub is, is a bit more juvenile. They, they can look very, very similar at a glance. So I'll go through some of the ways you can um, ID them. Uh, Dace are typically smaller than a Chub. So the guide there is 10 to 25 centimetres. Uh, that's roughly the size of, of adult Dace that you're going to, to find. Um, silver and sleek, so they can be confused with roach, but they tend to be um, a bit a bit thinner and longer and sleeker in profile and without that orange tinge to their fins. And if I don't know if you can see the anal and dorsal fins, particularly the anal fin of the dace, the back of the fin has a concave shape to it, so it sort of goes in a little bit there. And that's quite a, a, an easy way of um, IDing a dace when you, especially when you have one in your hand. So they're only found in flowing water, uh, reasonably fast flowing as well. Um, typically found around weirs and mills where the, where the water's rushing over a surface and there's quite a high oxygen level. And they're a very active midwater feeder and they will feed on the surface as well. So moving over to the chub now, um, another long sleek fish, but they're more cylindrical in profile, so more of a kind of a bullet shape to them. They'll typically be bigger than dace as well. So um, reaching up to 45 centimetres, possibly even, even bigger than that for a good sized chub. Um, and they, especially as they get older, you see, they start to get these um, more vivid colours. They're their uh, fins become a more reddy colour, especially their, um, their anal and pelvic fins become more red and they've got a darker dorsal and tail fin. And also as they mature, they, they get a lovely golden shine to them, a lovely golden colour. They have a relatively large mouth with white lips. Um, you can actually see this if you're looking down onto them. So if you're on the riverbank, or a bridge looking down, you can sometimes make out that white lip and you can see the, the red on the fins as well. So it's quite a good way of IDing them. Um, found in flowing water and very similar habitats to the dace actually, but um, they can live in still water. Some fishermen um, stock them to lakes and they, because of their large mouth and their, their larger size, they will, as they uh, mature, they will predate on small fish and even crayfish as well. Yeah, so we're getting a little bit, a little bit bigger now with the coarse fish. Uh, we've got carp and bream uh, sharing slides. 
I'll go through the carp first. Now, carp are non-native. They don't originate in the UK. Uh, they were introduced. They were originally, going back a long, long time, hundreds of years ago, they were, um, they were introduced for food. Um, but now perhaps they are the most widespread species of fish in the world. Um, they originated in Asia and they live now on every continent in the world apart from Antarctica. Uh, they can grow large, they can grow very large, um, especially in fishing lakes where they've been stocked and where fishermen are feeding them. If the water quality is okay, they can, they can grow very, very large. Um, I've put 80 centimetres as a guide there for the River Severn. Uh, that's probably about as big as they get in the Severn. Um, they're an, an elongated oval shape, so they're slightly deeper than the deeper in profile to the other silverfish that I talked about, and a, more of a browny colour to them with chestnut colour to their fins. But they have this long dorsal fin. Look at that, the back of that carp. Most of the length of the back of that carp is taken up with this very long dorsal fin. And they have a protractile mouth, which means their mouth can, can kind of extend. It sort of folds up and they can extend it. Um, and this helps them feed. It helps them um, search for food in amongst the, uh, the, the riverbed, the substrate on the floor. Um, so they also have barbula as well, which I mentioned at the beginning. Moving over to bream, uh, they're more of a, an oval disc shape. They definitely get a, a deeper, um, a deeper shape to them. And if you view them from above or from the front, they're also sort of quite flattened as well. So they become this kind of disc shape, especially as, as they mature. So average adult size for a bream looking at between 30 to 55 centimetres for a, a mature adult bream. Um, when they're younger, they do look and act like one of our, one of our typical silver fish that I mentioned earlier. So they can be confused with, um, with a roach, for example. But as they mature, they get the deeper body, they get the bronze colour to them. And if you're comparing them to carp, they're dorsal fin is much shorter, whereas their anal fin is much longer. So easy to tell them apart. They do too have a protractile mouth. Um, so bottom feeding um, typically uh, bound in the, in the lower areas of, of deeper water usually. So in the, in the silt. Found in flowing water, they've been found in, they, they, can, they can live in lakes as well but slow moving fresh water and they can shoal in large numbers. So if you're fishing and you catch one, um, get your bait back in the water quickly because there's probably a few others around. Uh, so sticking with coarse fish, I'm gonna hand you over to Ed so he can take you through a few species. Thank you, Ed. Thanks Pete, that's brilliant. All right, so we've got two, two fish that potentially look fairly similar here. Um, you can see their average adult size separates them straight away. You've got the, the mini gudgeon, um, which should be in one of those minor species. We'll try not to forget it later when we cover those. And then we've got the barbel, which um, can get pretty massive, to be honest. Um, you know, anything up to 10 kilos in this country, which is a big, hefty fish. Um, they're both pretty well designed for, for fast water um, and you'll find them in slow water as well but but really you know they're kind of bottom feeding fast water specialists um, which will also utilize slower water rather than the other way around so looking at the gudgeon um, they're quite a, a striking little fish you can just about make out in that, that picture there some of the, the specimens you get they're sort of this mishmash of um, blacks, blues, um, purples, bit of a rainbow shine along the side with a silver belly. A few dark spots along the side as well. But it's definitely that underslung, monk, um, underslung mouth that's gonna give you a bit of a clue there. And um, the additional thing with the gudgeon is it's got a, a barbule on the corner of each side of its mouth. So two barbules in total. Um, 
And these are, are really helpful if you're, you're bottom feeding, um, and particularly in rivers that can get very brown and colored, you know, get a bit of rain and some floods. You know, these fish still want to feed as long as the temperature's right. So um, there's sort of sensory organs, they can taste, um, you know, they can feel around for food with them. Um, so that's that's a, a key identification feature with the gudgeon. Should you get a tiny barbel and a tiny gudgeon, um, the barbel's got four barbules. Um, similar thing, you know, using those to root around the bottom and feel and taste for, for food items. Um, but with the gudgeon, maximum size 16 centimeters, and yeah, they, they can form quite decent shoals in pools. So if you're out fish serving, you might pick, pick quite a number up, or they might be slightly more widely distributed along a, a, a longer glide or something like that. And fairly similar with the barbel. When they're younger, they're smaller, they tend to be, you know, small shoals, sometimes big shoals. Um, and as they get bigger, and as they get really big, tend to be sort of more solitary fish. Um, both sort of summer spawners. So, you know, kind of looking around June, July time, um, high water temperatures, so 15, 16, 17, 18 plus, that kind of thing. Um, spawning on gravel, a um, little bit more sort of gravelly, sandy stuff, the gudgeon there. Um, but yeah, barbel, you know, much bigger fish. They're kind of the opposite end of the game fish, still gravel spawners, but utilizing the gravel at a totally different time of year. And then color wise, uh, depending on the specimen you've got, it can be a really, really sort of deep golden bronze, you know, really quite a, a strong, um, shiny fish kind of thing. Through to a bit more of a brown, um, no sort of real rhyme or reason. It's just sort of genetics, you know, maybe a bit to do with the coloration of the river they're in. Um, but yeah, sort of a, a, a brownie through to gold colour. Um, and they can have, you know, a bit more of an orange tinge to the, the fins. Again, as they sort of mature a bit more, these colours will come out a little bit more in the fins like the chub people's talking about. But yeah, quite quite big fish, very strong fish, the barbels. So really designed for strong flows. Um, the River Severn, which we cover, is it's a very powerful river, particularly in the middle sections and upper sections. These barbel have no problem um, inhabiting those reaches. Um, you know, your, your flow velocity is a little bit lower near the bed of the river anyway, but really big, powerful fish. Next slide, please, Pete. So next up, we've got the perch and the pike. As we said in the beginning, um, they're, they're sort of genetically aside from the, the cyprinid family. Um, so we've got perch, um, which are part of the Per Percidae family, and then pike, um, which is completely different again, um, being the genus Esox. Um, both predatory, but so I eat quite a heavy fish component to their diet, but 100% for the pike. It's basically like a freshwater shark. Um, if you look at the fish on the right, the pike, it's a lean, streamlined fish eating machine. Perch on the left, um, particularly when they're, they're smaller, um, they're more happy to have a, a bigger sort of invertebrate part of their diet. Um, but as they get a bit bigger, you know, generally switching over to 100% fish again. Both from utilizing camouflage. So the big thing for the perch really makes it stand out from all the other fish you're going to see. If you see a fish with these tiger stripes down the side, the dark barring on the green backgrounds, 100% a perch, there's no other fish in. Um, fresh water that's got those bars like that, uh, in the UK that is. Um, so quite good for ambush um, predation of other fish species, but also for the perch, it's part of its defense mechanism. So it helps it blend into the weeds, very much associated with structure. Um, if you get uh, sort of ribbon weed beds, um, you know, perch are gonna be associated with those, but definitely, slower moving sections of water. So they're not really a sort of fast water species. So where you get these really big stands of um, aquatic vegetation in the edge of slower flowing rivers, um, lower sections, say the Severn, the Thames, and stuff like that, all along the edge you can have perch using it. And those vertical bars really help them camouflage in amongst those stands of weed. Um, so they can ambush dragonfly nymphs, any small fish coming past, so on and so forth. Generally got quite striking, um, Ready orangey fins. So it helps them stand out again. And then they've got the two dorsal fins. 
And word of warning, the front one, along with the gill cover, um, quite spiky. So vertical spikes in the dorsal fin, really don't want to get a bare hand on those. And then just on the tip of the gill cover, um, you've got quite a sharp sort of spiky element there. And that helps the fish sort of be a little bit less, um, you know, of a, a prey for, for fish eating birds, for other predatory fish. You know, they can get those spikes up and really, really put the predators off. And then going over to the right with the pike, um, you know, if you look at the, the difference in form there, the, uh, the perch is a bit more of a classic fish, you know, a little bit more rounded um, in shape when you're viewing it from the side and, and oval when you're viewing it from the front. The pike completely elongate. And if you look at the fins on the pike, it's uh, dorsal fins set quite far back on the body. And this is basically so it can be the, the cheater of the freshwater world. So it can accelerate from zero to 100 really quickly. You know, really um, well positioned fins far back on the body. It can do that burst swimming really quite fast. So it can come out of cover, grab an unsuspecting roach or something, and then sink back into the, the murky depths. Um, being an out and out predator, um, you see it's got quite an elongate head, um, it's got quite a wide gape to the mouth, so if he wants to grab a fish, it can really open that mouth up quite wide, and it's absolutely lined with really, really sharp teeth. Um, teeth all along the tongue as well, so if you ever get to handle a pike, um, definitely don't put your hand in its mouth, because it's going to shred your fingers to pieces straight away, the razor sharp teeth. Um, Coloration again can vary, uh, always mottled, but it can be a bit more greeny, it can be, be a bit more browny, and that just helps it sort of blend in with the weeds. Um, it might utilize murky water, um, but yeah, camouflaged fish. Um, and interestingly for pike, they're not just sort of predating other fish species, so roach would be an absolute favorite. If you find a shoulder roach, you can guarantee there's not a pike far away. Um, they heavily predate each other, so you'll find that pike will spawn um, and a young pike is actually high on the menu for the bigger pike, which are just going to gobble each other up. And then, you know, the, the, the top of the ladder is going to end up being this massive thing of a meter and a half long and about 30 pounds and everyone else is, is food below it. So that coloration also helps younger pike try and blend into the weeds a bit um, and get, get further on down their, their, their life uh, before they get eaten by, you know, essentially their mother, which is a bit grim, but there you go. <laughs> Um, and they have large territories, interesting, um, more solitary lifestyle, um, you know, they tend to feed in one area and then sort of um, have refuge areas elsewhere so they don't sort of spook the prey and stuff. And one of our earlier spawners, so um, kind of about this time of year the pike are all geared up to spawn, so they're finding weedy margins um, to, to lay their eggs in. Um, similar for the perch, you know, they won't be far behind, um, you know, sort of more of a cold water species um kind of spawning strategy there next slide please Pete. so jumping into the tiddlers um these are the minor species that you get to go out in the little streams paddling when you're a kid maybe you've got a little hand net um you catch these little guys up you definitely put gudgeon in there as well as we said earlier um Minor species, uh, I guess maybe because they don't grow to a very big spot, uh, size, but still a really important component of the freshwater ecosystem, um, either through what they do functionally or, you know, as food for other fish and birds and stuff. So we've got a couple of three species there, kicking off with the three spined stickleback, bit of a classic. Um, there's a couple of other species of stickleback in the country, so we've got nine, um, can be confused with the 10 spine stickleback and a 15 spine stickleback as well. And it all comes down to the um, number of spines it's got on its back. So straight away, you've got that kind of ID feature if you think it's a stickleback. Uh, very, very small fish. So, you know, tiny, tiny little things. Um, you know, I guess kind of about six, seven centimeters would be a reasonably big one. Um, and quite a distinct form. So they almost look a little bit perchy, like a miniature perch. They're a little bit spiny. Um, you know, they've got sort of quite distinct gill covers there. And the thing that really picks them out is this very, really, really, really thin wrist of the tail. So you've got quite a big body, very thin wrist of the tail, and this tiny little fan tail. So they're not really a fast water specialist at all. Um, you know, they're very much looking for slow moving water, 
margins of rivers, in and around weeds, um, the edge of small streams, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we listed in the habitats there, uh, margins and ditches. Um, it's quite easy to go past the freshwater ditch, non-flowing water, and think nothing lives in it. But generally speaking, ponds, ditches, um, you'll be quite surprised where these little sticklebacks get to. Um, quite how they get there is out, out of speculation. A lot of people think birds, you know, kind of get the eggs on their feet or, um, you know, pick one up and drop it or something like that. But you can have a tiny little ponds um, somehow sticklebacks managed to get in. So you'll see them just sort of bobbing around in the margins. It can be a shoaling fish. Um, sort of got the, the, the sort of quite distinct shape there. Colour-wise, they can be quite silvery. They can be quite brown. Um, so, you know, if you get them out, you kind of get the silver belly and then a little bit more camouflage on the back of the, the darker colours. Um, when it comes to spawning, we've got this, this little guy at the bottom here. He's actually a male fish. They're quite interesting. Um, they, they develop this really vivid red throat and a blue eye. But it's the male that, that builds a nest, attracts a mate, and then once the eggs are laid, it actually guards the nest. So it's really um, probably the only nest guarding fish we've got, you know, out and out nest guarding fish in the UK, to be fair. Um, but yeah, tiny little fish, lots of sort of pluck, looks after his nest, makes sure the little guys hatch out. So it's uh, a little bit of a different fish where generally the fish will just spawn and swim off and leave the young to it. Um, Another very common minor species we'll find is minnow. So particularly in the seven catchment, most water courses um, will have minnows in there somewhere from upland streams all the way down into the main river. So kind of utilizing a wide variety of habitats there. Again, a very small fish. Um, you know, we've sort of got four to nine centimeters down there as an average size. And again, they sort of look like a proper fish. So quite slender. Um, but no sort of like um, flattening to the sides or being very deep in body, just sort of nice slender fish there. And the one thing that will really mark them out, you see a big shoulder minnows, you know, clear day, it's a nice sunny day, you can see in the river, got the shoulder fish flicking around. You'll see this really dark bar along the side of the fish. So sometimes when I'm out with people, okay, oh, you know, are they small trout or, you know, maybe sticklebacks or something, and you'll just see the fish flicking around in the current and you can see this quite distinct dark bar, silvery belly, dark back. Um, so they're quite quite distinct features. Um, but like I say, definitely a river fish, but utilise quite a right, wide range of habitats there. Next slide, please, Pete. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. Um, so carrying on with the minor species, or the, the little tiddlers, just a couple more to go through. And um, We've got bullhead and stone loach, which are both uh, very small bottom feeding fish that are found in streams. They, they share the same habitat very often. So I'll just go through some of the differences between them so that you can ID them if you if you were to catch either. Uh, so starting with the bullhead, um, yeah, small fish, five to ten centimetres typically. Um, now they've got this nickname Miller's Thumb. Um, yeah, traditionally Miller's um, would damage their thumbs quite a lot while they were working through getting them pricked and flattened. And um, yeah, bullheads are, are quite ugly and they are kind of thumb size and shape. So they got this nickname, the Miller's Thumb, which is kind of stuck. Um, the brindled brown sort of patterns on them, but they're definitely a brown, brown fish whenever you see them. Uh, an ugly blunt head. The photo there with the two bullhead in it it doesn't show some of their features like their patterns very well and also they have two dorsal fins like a perch so it doesn't show that very well but what the photo does show is their strange shape from above they're kind of more more tadpole sort of shape than than fish in a way um, and also they have these quite large um, fan-shaped pectoral fins and the, the fish on the right is uh, showing those off quite nicely. So yeah generally if you're going to catch one I think the shape of this is going to give it away as being a bullhead. Um, yeah found in flowing water and suited to to living in amongst the sediment and the weed and the mud um, on the on the bottom feeding on small invertebrates. Um, so that's yeah similar to the stone loach um, 
certainly seen many sections of river where there's numerous bullhead and stone loach together. Um, again, another small fish, but the shape is very, very different to a bullhead. Long, thin, cylindrical shape to them, very typical of a, of a loach. Um, darker in colour to a gudgeon, so I suppose they could be confused with a gudgeon if they were kind of similar sizes, but stone loach tend to be darker. And also they have six barbula around their mouths um, instead of gudgeon, which has two. So yeah, small, fast flowing streams living in the sediment or around the sediment, and um, they tend to prefer the sandy, sandier gravels. So they were our minor species. Now moving on to the, the last few uh, slides now. Um, talk about shads, because our, our project is sort of very, the, the Unlocking the Seven, we're very shad focused. We want to help all migrating fish, but um, we're primarily there to, to help the, the shad. And I joined the project about a year and a half ago. Um, but before that, I'd been I'd been a fisherman all my life. I'd never heard of these these types of fish. Um, quite rare now, um, but used to be very very present in the River Severn in their in their tens of thousands. So we've got two species of shad: the Twaite shad and the Alice shad. Um, I'll go through the key features of the Twaite shad. So they're very they've got a very streamlined um, body. They are of the herring family. So they're a sea fish, anadromous fish, part of the herring family. Average adult size between 30, 45 centimeters, something like that typically when they, when they enter fresh water. And they have a, a very silvery color. They're, they're very, very silvery with a bluish sort of shimmer to them. And if you look on the lovely illustration in the center of the screen, it's behind its gill covers. It's sort of got one large, um, dark spot and then a few other dark spots behind it. They typically have between three and ten but they tend to, to, to fade the further back you go on the fish and they have a very distinctive pointed forked tail. So to talk about the differences between the Alice and the Twate um, it's very very difficult to do because they are very very similar at a glance to look at. Um, so a similar colour got the dark spots again but the size is the main difference so if we've got any um, shad monitoring volunteers with us which I believe we do um, the main thing you're going to notice is that you're going to see a lot of shad going past the the notch at upper load and they're all going to be of a similar size and then every so often you might see a bigger one or two or three that are, that are clearly bigger than the others and the chances are that they're Alice shad but other than that, there's not a lot of differences between the two that you can tell through looking at them. And also hybrids are common, so they will spawn with each other. So you do get Alice and Twite, Alice Shad and Twite Shad hybrids. So they, round about now, they're probably in the, in the Severn Estuary somewhere in the Bristol Channel. And um, in May, they're going to, well, late April and May, they're going to make their way upstream. There's a, a handful of rivers in the UK that, that they will um, migrate into. There's not many now. And um, they're entering fresh water. The main aim is to spawn. They're looking for their perfect spawning conditions, which is shallow, lovely clear water um, with a gravel substrate. And that's where that's where they spawn. They spawn at night, usually at around 2 a.m. Um, and yeah, the big problems for these guys are the barriers, weirs and mills, where a couple of hundred years ago they would have they would have been able to swim up to their spawning grounds, no problem. But there's now many barriers in their way, which is um, the, the main thing that the Unlocking the Seven project is working on. They cannot leap up barriers, so you might see salmon um, jumping. In, in autumn time. Shad generally won't do that, although they're a powerful fish, they, they won't really jump up barriers. Um, and there, yeah, just a note to say, there's a good place to see them is Upper Load Weir in May. And I think 
if if um, if COVID allows, hopefully we'll get out there in May and we'll be able to see some migrating through a, a notch that's been cut in the weir. Might hand over to you now, Ed, if that's okay. You can take us through these species, lampreys and eels. Yeah, of course it is, Pete. Right, so um, I guess the reason we put those guys all in the same group, uh, they're pretty much the snake-like fish that you're going to see in the river, so um, nothing else quite like it. So if you see a long snake-like fish winding its way up the river, generally, well, generally, it is going to be a lamprey or an eel. So we've got three three species of lamprey in the UK. Um, we managed to fit them all in this slide here. Um, they're reasonably similar sort of um, life histories, but um, you know some differences there as well. So the river and the sea lamprey, um, uh, Anadromus. So go and see um, again, like the the salmon and sea trout, there's rich feeding out of sea. Um, lots of nutrients to be had so they can come back much bigger to spawn, produce a lot more eggs and a lot more offspring. Um, so starting with the sea lamprey, which is our biggest, um, quite an impressive fish, sort of a big mossly brownie um, type of thing. So if you're up the load in the spring doing the uh, shad monitoring, if you're there early enough in the morning or late enough, late enough in the afternoon, probably guaranteed you're going to see some of these guys go over the top. Quite big, a um, little bit monstrous. We're debating whether to put these in the aliens and monsters section um, because below you can see a lamprey mouth, which is pretty horrendous, really. Um, it's just a round, jawless sucker with a load of teeth in it. So, the reason these guys are swimming out to sea is to go and find um, a host fish and they're um, pretty much parasitic by. Um, rasping onto the side of a fish where they can suck the flesh and blood out of the, the, the host fish. Um, so pretty, pretty uh, nasty sort of looking mouth to do that business down there. Um, so very much a, a river species. Um, you do get a couple of landlocked populations uh, in this country and over in the States, um, the river lamprey um, has seen a bit as a bit of a problem um just because there's so many of them they're in the lakes um and they're they're quite quite a sort of uh, parasitic pest over there but just jumping back to the river lamprey much smaller than that that big sea lamprey that can get up sort of an average size of about a meter um a little bit more sort of gray silvery color to it less mottles um a lot rarer in seven so, um, you know, we're kind of looking into where these river lampreys are and, and what they get up to. Um, there's no gill covers. Um, they've just got gill pores. So you can just see along the side of the, the sea lamprey, they may be a little bit clearer. They're just literally holes, the seven of them. Um, very primitive prehistoric fish. Um, you know, haven't bothered developing a gill cover or a mouth. Um, and very similar that they all spawn um, kind of late spring, summertime. So you get the river and sea lamprey entering the river, coming in springtime, looking to spawn sort of, you know, maybe July, so summertime. Um, brook lamprey, you know, maybe a little bit earlier in the spring. But what they all do is they build a nest. So the other thing that gruesome sucker mouth can do is pick stones up and, and dig a little nest in the gravel so they can lay the eggs in it um, and cover them up with gravel and they're nice and protected then. Uh, once these eggs hatch out uh, into the larvae, they're, they're just drifting the current and what they're trying to locate is some silt beds. So they burrow into the silt bed where they live as something called an anaceti. Um, and they're just fil filtering microscopic particles in. Um, and they're going to be in there for anything between four to seven years, depending on the species. Um, the river and sea lamprey, they'll hatch out, um, hatch out, they'll emerge out of the, the silt um, and migrate down to the sea sort of autumn time um, after you know a good few years in the silt beds. Um, brook lamprey, they'll hatch out, but then they'll stay completely in fresh water. So that's what differentiates the brook lamprey to the other two species. And they're much, 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 much smaller. So if you see a little wriggly thing um, in a brook somewhere, chances are it might be a, 
uh, brook lamprey, depending where you are, not a small eel. Um, so the brook lamprey, they'll overwinter, they won't feed, and then they'll spawn, and then they'll die. So they're all dying off spawning again. Um, but yeah, key difference there, size, coloration, and then where they're sort of um, spending their lives. So you've got the two bigger ones going out to sea and a smaller one staying completely in the river. And within that river, it wants clean flowing water, um, generally in shallower streams and usually associated with silt beds. Next slide, please, Pete. So another snake-like fish, um, but as you'll see, it's got jaws and it's not got that horrible rasping mouth. So straight away, you can see it's not a lamprey, <laughs> which is good. Um, and total opposite um, sort of life history. So it's growing up in fresh water and spawning over in the Sargasso Sea, quite a famous sort of migration. Um, still one of our wildlife mysteries. We still don't manage to find exactly where eels spawn or how they go about it. There is a project going on at the moment, which is trying to track them down. Um, but once they get in the Atlantic Ocean, they're very, very difficult to um, follow. Um, all we know is they get to this, this area of the Sargasso Sea and they, they do their business there. So again, they hatch out as larvae. They're utilizing currents to distribute themselves. So they'll drift all the way across the Atlantic Ocean as these leptocephali. Um, very clear. So um, you know, they're not, not getting too heavily predated as they're doing that. Um, and kind of arriving at the UK shores anyway, uh, late winter, early spring. So kind of around now, you know, going to start to see a few starting to turn up here, really building to a head in the spring. Um, and by the time they got here, they've grown on to take on a proper little eel shape. So they're still transparent, but they look a lot, a lot more like an eel. So if you hear the term glass eel, this is what it means. It means very, very small eels. Um, once they hit the fresh water, they'll then start to take on pigmentation and colour up. Um, but they'll come in their absolute droves. So they're a massively endangered species at the moment. Um, various figures out there, you know, anywhere up to 95% um, population crash in recent years. But we're still really lucky in the Severn and we get a large number come to the Severn estuary. So we're quite a hot spot for um, working out the conservation effort for eels. So the glass eels will get harvested, but it's not necessarily to take them away to farm them um, as they traditionally like to eat them. It'll also be for conservation projects to stock them out elsewhere um, and try and keep the, the species going. Um, they're very, very slimy, so very thick skin, um, scaleless, and uh, one of the eels' special abilities is they can utilize kind of um, wet stormy nights to uh, travel over land a little bit so if you've got wet grass they'll quite happily come out on the water course um, and slide over into a pond or you know into a canal or something so they're really good at distributing themselves in the catchment um, and once they hit the fresh water they're generally termed as a yellow eel so the coloration is this sort of greeny gray back um, maybe a bit more of a yellow belly and they'll spend sort of five six seven years maybe as a male maybe a little bit more anywhere up to 20, anywhere to the extremity of 40 years in fresh water as a female growing absolutely massive, um, you know, meter, meter and a half long kind of eel lurking in the bottom of a deep lake somewhere. Um, and there's no set year that they'll, that year class that's arrived at the seven will all decide to go and head off for spawning. Um, they'll just take their cue and they'll, they'll, they'll head off in um, dribs and drabs, depending on the year, um, back to the Sargasso Sea. So generally in autumn, um, sort of hit that time of year, the eels start moving down the river, heading out to the estuary to start their, their uh, migration back to the Sargasso. And like I say, there could be anywhere between just a few years in fresh water to a couple of decades and all different sizes. And generally when they're in fresh water, when they're smaller, like most um, fish progress, they'll start on invertebrates, so they're eating um, anything from mayfly nymphs, dragonfly nymphs, um, as they get bigger they'll start to specialise on uh, fish, but they're, they're also good at scavenging, so if you get, you know, something dead in there, eels will come along and take, um, you know, that sort of freshwater carrion, so to speak, and feed on that as well. And that's the, the eels and lampreys. Back to you then, Pete. Right.
Thank you, Ed. Yeah. So just a few more to go over. I'll go over the. I'll go over a couple, and then um, you can have the big finale, Ed, with the sturgeon. Okay. So um, monsters and aliens. Yeah. I mean, we've got three species that didn't really fit into the other groups. We've got Xander, Wells catfish, and Atlantic sturgeon. Um, Xander is an is an alien. Wells catfish is a monster and an alien, and the Atlantic sturgeon is most certainly a monster. Uh, so I'll just go through these now. We've got the Xander first of all. Now the Xander is a non-native species. It didn't originate here, it's been introduced. Um, and it can be invasive. So invasive means that it can have a, a negative impact on our native populations of fish. Um, so it's a, it's a predator. They resemble a large perch. On the, not the best picture, I'm afraid, but you can, it, it's kind of got that perch shape to it. But what is very, very similar to the perch is its um, dorsal fins. So it's got that front dorsal fin, which is spiky, and then it has another dorsal fin behind it. Um, it's a more of a pale green than a, than a perch, and it doesn't have those striking black vertical stripes. Um, it, it does have some markings on its side, but they're much fainter um, and a, they're a paler colour as well. So they've got teeth like a perch um, and sometimes some people, especially fishermen, they call they can call these fish pike perch. Um, that's not strictly speaking correct. They're not a cross between a pike and a perch, which some people believe they are. They are their own species. Um, and typically they're found in the deeper sections of the river. So in the, in the River Severn, they're going to be found in the, in the areas that are going to be deepest. So from, from Worcester south, probably. Um, they're more likely to be found in the, um, in the fens, actually, uh, in the east of England, um, in the big drainage ditches that they have. Um, and yeah, they're, they're an ambush predator, so similar to the pike and perch in a way, but easy to distinguish once you, once you see one. Wow, <laughs> the Wells catfish, look at that, most certainly a monster. Um, very, very large fish, um, easy to identify, don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but I must say they are not aggressive in any way, so don't worry, it looks scary, but if you're, if you're paddling, on the shore of the Severn, it, you're, you're quite safe, don't worry. Um, so a metre plus, um, two metres plus in some cases, these, these catfish can get absolutely huge, especially um, on the continent where the water's a bit warmer. So very large head, um, tiny eyes, very wide mouth, um, but very easy to ID with these huge barbula. I believe they've got three pairs of barbula, but one of the pairs are extremely long, looking more like antennae. So um, with those features, clearly it's suited to very, very deep water using those barbula to, to search for their food. Um, they have a very relatively tiny dorsal fin and they're a, a, a sort of a gray, browny gray color. So definitely, you're going to find them more likely to find them rather in the larger rivers, so Severn and possibly Thames, um, slow flowing rivers um, and lakes. So these were introduced, they're, they're non native, they were introduced in the Victorian times. Um, they may have been introduced by some people who have, who have got hold of them for aquariums or ponds and they've just outgrown their conditions. So they pop them in the river or the local lake. Um, yeah, they, they feed on other fish, so they can scavenge. So like, like an eel, I suppose, any, any dead animals sink to the bottom, the, the catfish can mop them up, but they'll, they'll hunt as well equally. Um, and we've, we've popped this uh, species on our slides. They're, they're a good species to introduce to people and to talk about. We're not totally sure of their distribution. Um, or presence even in the, in the River Severn. Um, Ed believes that they are in the River Severn. Um, some anglers have seen them or, or maybe hooked them. Um, 
but there's some there's some studies over the next couple of years where they're going to take water samples and um, and search for them that way to find um, to find out whether they're actually there or not. So yeah, that's the Welsh catfish. Um, Ed. So yeah, so uh, to finish off, we've got another monster there. Um, when I say monster. Yeah, absolutely massive. Um, can get up to sort of three meters in size. Um, the Atlantic sturgeon. So, are these in the seven? Well, yes, they are. Um, we've got a sort of um, a beginning of a conservation interest in this country now in Atlantic sturgeon and where they are. And there's some really interesting research going on looking at the, the history of them. Um, and they were very much caught in the Severn and several other rivers around the UK, um, even commercially, uh, medieval times, uh, at Worcester Cathedral, there's a carving on the stones um, by a pair of steps of a sturgeon that was caught in the Severn. So we're quite interested in what these guys were up to. Um, very much uh, a species of conservation concern, massive declines, the usual story with fish, uh, migratory fish between barriers and rivers, rivers being polluted. Um, you know, they've just lost their range over the, the, the course of, of years. Um, so they do visit the River Severn. They're not designated as a native species at the moment. Um, they're seen as a sort of transient species. So looking at their life history, um, they're born in fresh water. They'll spend a couple of years in fresh water. Well, they'll then migrate out to sea and feed out at sea and grow into these enormous sizes. Um, they reach sexual maturity about a metre in length. So you're not really going to see an adult uh, sturgeon come back to the fresh water before it's about a metre long. Um, very flattened nose, so quite a distinct fish. It's scaleless, but it's got these really prehistoric looking um, bony plates, uh, five, five sets running along the fish uh, called scutes. So you can see them along the dorsal edge of the fish, along its sides um, and along the, the belly there. Um, so they, they head out to sea, big bony fish, very elongate, long nose, um, two barbule, chances are they're feeding on the bottom with that un underslung mouth. Um, you know, if you look at the, the morphology of the fish, uh, growing to these massive sizes, where they then decide to um, come back into freshwater to spawn. And I've seen a couple of videos of freshwater sturgeon, um, Atlantic sturgeon spawning in freshwater, and it's a uh, sight to be beholden because you've got these two meter fish thrashing around in the margins of uh, a river. I think it would make anyone um, be a little bit wary if they saw that walking dog down the side of the seven on a Saturday morning. Um, but yeah, going, going back to the seven, um, not, not a native species, seen as a transient species. Um, there's a restoration project going on in France. So we believe the, the fish making it to the Severn will come from um, this conservation effort over in France where they're sort of help rearing the fish, re reintroducing them to a couple of rivers there. Um, and then being a sort of um, bit of a pioneer, most migratory species, you know, stick their nose into different rivers um, to see what's going on there. You know, we see some fish coming in here. And records show, even in recent times, there's probably been enough fish coming into the Severn for them to attempt spawning, where they've been detected in, in group sizes enough that would indicate, you know, there's potential spawning going on. So there's a bit of a push now to, to make them um, a native species. So, you know, they climb up the conservation ladder and potentially we can then put some money into helping them return to the Severn properly. But really impressive fish, absolutely massive. Um, Mainly in the, the main rivers, big rivers, um, you know, I don't think you're going to get shot walking down your local small stream and see a three metre sturgeon migrating up there, but definitely one of our monsters and definitely one that we get in the seven of Acacia. So that's sturgeon. Thank you very much.